My name is Remy Hamapande, Zambia Country Director for Forgotten Voices. I want to welcome you all to our annual Come and See event. We are so glad you are here, whether you are joining us in person or through the live stream. We are thankful for each and every one of you who is joining us tonight. This year's Come and See is a special one because we are celebrating 15 years of ministry. 15 years of saving the orphaned and vulnerable, together with all of you. Tonight, we want to highlight many of the voices that have been part of this journey and celebrating all that God has done in the past. We also share with you some stories of how all have been a part of the story that God is writing. Lastly, we will share with you what the future looks like and how we can create a better future, one where every child knows the love of God and the security of a family. Hello, Malibanji. That's our vernacular for how are you? I am Steve Rogers Monjes, a country director for Forgotten Voices Malawi. We are so full of joy to see Forgotten Voices grow 15 years in existence. We are grateful to God for all He's allowed us to achieve, and that is in partnership with the local church, being His hands and feet. We are so looking forward, so excited, stepping into the future with hope. Blessings. As we celebrate uh, 15 years of ministry, we want to look back and see where it all began. We have prepared a short video that uh, reflects our beginnings. Let's take a look. Forgotten Voices has been driven by a partnership between the American Church and the African Church and listening to and partnering with local voices to serve the orphan crisis has always been the core of our mission. Forgotten Voices started out of a mission trip that our church, West Shore Free Church, had sent me and 11 others on a mission trip to figure out what we could do as a church. And um, we met all these children who had lost their parents and families who were about to die, leaving kids behind, and we were just overwhelmed by that. And so we kept meeting all these local pastors who had very clear visions for what should be done about the children orphaned by AIDS. My early experience of poverty in Africa was profound. I mean, I, I think that I had known about poverty. I had studied poverty, but to see poverty up hand, to see uh, a, a, probably the most profound moment was seeing a young woman, probably in her mid twenties, watching her kids watch her die. And they had lost all of their crops, most of their animals, um, they really had nothing and uh, the father had already died, this mom was dying and her seven-year-old and four-year-old were watching her die. And just the, the void of resources, um, economic resources, the void of physical resources, the, the void of relational resources uh, was, was profound. At the time, the orphan crisis was growing and HIV AIDS was spreading quickly Poverty was trapping families, and children were being orphaned every single day. But the local church in Africa was also growing. It became clear that God was calling a group of faithful people to invest and listen to local churches in Southern Africa who desired to help orphans but lacked the resources to meet the needs in their community. Because it's rare that you, you have organizations come from outside and come and partner with churches, letting the church do the ministry themselves, believing in the leadership of the church to do what God has called them to do. Over the years, the ministry grew in Zimbabwe, forgotten voices and expanded into Zambia and Malawi to serve and walk alongside more churches caring for orphaned and vulnerable children. For every child that is orphaned or vulnerable, there is a story behind them. Here's a story of one of the children that have been helped early on in Zimbabwe. 
My name is Nitness. I am a girl aged 14 and I live in Mchabe's Mission. I live with 17 people. My mom, two grandmothers, <laughs> one grandfather, three uncles, my sister, brother, and my young brother, and my four cousins. I think I'm done. I woke up early in the morning and make fire. Give the children food. And I will then collect my cousins from their homestead and go to the school. Education to me is a key of success because you can't live in this world in our days without education. When I grow up, I wish to be an accountant or an air hostess. At home, I had many work to do. I have to clean the room we use with my mom and my sister. And um, I will have to write my homework when I have got it. When the stance is about to go down, I will then iron my uniforms and make it ready for the coming day. In life, I had experienced some circumstances hard. So my life is quite okay. It's not bad and it's not that very good. The four people were sick, which is my uncle, my grandfather, my young brother, and my mother. My uncle is very sick. My father died on 15 June 2006. I, I felt pain because my father loved me a lot. And um, my father was about something like 42 years old. And I was in grade six. The program helped help my family, the workers, much easier for my mom because she does not think any more about school fees. She knows that it is going to be paid. I think God is going to bless me and I hope I'm going to live a better life. And I think I'm going to experience good times. I pray that may God help me experience that in life. As we celebrate our 15th year of ministry, uh, it is a joy for us to have our founding leaders with us and we want to have just uh, a chat with them and ask a few questions as we celebrate what God has done over the years. And uh, we're glad to have, uh, you know, our founder and president, uh, you know, former president, uh, Ryan Kidd uh, with us and also have uh, Trevor Bunch who was uh, also one of our very founding board uh, members who has been, you know, really uh, continue to be with the ministry over the years. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. That's good. So, um, yeah, as we celebrate, uh, you know, this 15 year of ministry, we just wanted to reflect back mm -hmm. and kind of see, you know, what God has done uh, mm -hmm. over the years, but also really look at some of those foundational years of mm -hmm. uh, the ministry and how it started and just wanting to hear from your perspective. When, uh, when, the minister, uh, when you first became aware of the urgent need in Africa of the orphan and vulnerable children, um, what did you see as the, as the role of the church in Africa at that time? Yeah, I, I think that we saw that 
the role of the church was essential and and not just because we believe in the church and Trevor and I and, and the people that founded this ministry, we believe in the church, of course, but I think more fundamentally, we wanted to help and we didn't know what to do. And so we had this desire and we saw people suffering, we saw children and families in need and we desired to be part of a solution, but we actually didn't know what to do. And local pastors, Zimbabwean pastors from the Theological College of Zimbabwe that we were meeting did know what to do. And they were telling us their hopes and aspirations. And, and so we didn't just want them to be part of it because we wanted to listen to local people, right? Like it was actually, we didn't know what to do. And, and that actually that foundational truth of just saying, we don't know what to do became the backbone of the Ministry of Forgotten Voices. It wasn't this um, preconceived notion of an international yeah. development best practice. It was, we actually didn't know and local pastors did. And um, yeah, so they've been absolutely essential since the start. I mean, if you look at how, like systematically, God has always had a presence in country. Mm -hmm. And you, you look primarily at that point in time, and one of the things that was interesting was you had a very formal prosperous country. Yeah. Used to be the breadbasket of Africa. Mm -hmm. AIDS hit, not only do you have a, a economic crisis in country, yeah. but you had the primary workforce yeah. mm -hmm. destabilizing family structures at the same time. Yeah. And the one constant force, right. present force in the country was the church. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was the plan A there and, and the pastors were very well equipped, knew the people, knew the problems. Yeah. It, there wasn't some something else to create or something at the, somewhere else to go to yeah. to help partner. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that's really has set us up very well um, over the years to really keep the church at the center mm -hmm. and on the forefront of our response that we don't come and remove the church from it or do the things for the church but we allow the church to remain at the center of our activities and at the center of our work which is good I'm, I'm gonna add one more thing one yeah. thing that was very intentional is like when we were partnering with the pastors there mm -hmm. what a lot of faith-based ngos do is they take the top talent away from the national church structures right. and it cripples the national church because mm -hmm. you're taking the best leaders yeah. and leaving yeah. them in the place where they're coaching the younger pastors and helping out that development cycle and building the national church was really important yeah. that we are adding to the infrastructure not yeah. taking away not taking away that's good because the church is already responding you know, yeah. the church is doing something and our role now is to support the church in doing what they do and do yeah. well. We can bring all these other tools, but the whole aim and the outcome that we hope to see is that we want to see a church that is equipped to be able to respond to the needs of uh, often and vulnerable children in their own community. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Um, so through your involvement in caring for often and vulnerable children, what are some of the lessons that uh, God has taught you over the years. <laughs> there's so many, so many lessons, you know, it, it, there's so many. And uh, I, I would just say two, uh, one, um, the number one lesson that anyone who's ever heard me talk anywhere has probably heard me say this. I was saying it again last night at an event that um, God doesn't ask us to be God. He asks us to be faithful. Like dealing with the, the gravity of, of death and the number of families that our ministry has served over the years, like and repeating the bedside encounters of dying moms and dads and grandparents and even hurting children, like the, the enormity that pastors bear and the enormity that we as participants bear is too great. And, and it is paralyzing and there's moments of ministry that I have felt paralyzed by it. But God is still faithful, like his church is still doing the work of the church and no matter the circumstances, the church keeps going. And so God doesn't ask to be God, he has to be faithful, would be the one big one. And the other one I would offer is, uh, is one time a woman in Mozambique said to me, um, every mother wants to care for her own child. Sometimes that's not possible, but where it is we should let her. And I think when I learned that lesson and when we learned that lesson, we started to see 
grandparents and caregivers differently, that it wasn't us to see a need and even work through the local church, but it's actually equipping and reposturing the broader church to, to stand on their own as an expression of God's desire for people to provide for their own and and giving them the dignity that they deserve, that they're not just tokens of our generosity, but they're co-laborers. And so how do we see themselves as that? So I think a posture of equipping both, not just the church, but the caregiver to stand on their own as an expression of God's love uh, for the kids who they've taken in it is, is a powerful lesson that, that I, I still think about regularly. That's good. That's good. What are you trying to? I think keep it simple. Like a lot of times when we talk about something, the problem's so huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we try to overcomplicate it. We try to overprogram it. Yeah. Um, we miss the indicators that God's already at work. Yeah. And trying to figure out how to plug into that. Yeah. Uh, so like, I think one of the great things about, like on the U.S. side of the equation, was you know the folks writing thank you notes, the folks that helped us move into this farmhouse. Um, That's right. You know, it's it's those you know the kids that were doing bait sales for us. I think sometimes we try to aggrandize what we're doing, That's right. and we just. It's, it's God's work. We're just blessed to be part of it. Yeah. And we take the skills and what we have mm -hmm. and we figure out how to plug into it. Yeah. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Yeah. You don't have to have a master plan to even get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not that hard to write the first check. Yeah. It's not that hard to show up in an event mm -hmm. and support yeah. forgotten voices. Yeah, Amen. And, and I think that's been a, that's been a gift uh, that even you know, 15 years later, the community that we have here in uh, you know in this area of uh, the U.S. in uh, Dillsburg and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's amazing. And uh, I think it again it shows what God has been already building mm -hmm. here within the local church here in America and the local church in Africa that growth was happening in both areas you know mm -hmm. there is growth as you're inviting people to participate in what god is doing you know in africa also growth was happening here because you know people are seeing what yeah. god is doing and they are yeah. wanting to be part of that so mm -hmm. that's really something that i have seen just the amount of relationships the inheritance that we have of relationships here is amazing and we're grateful for that um yeah and then uh Let's talk of uh, stories that have, uh, you know, over the years, mm -hmm. if there is any story of transformation from this work that has really stuck out for you. Yeah, I mean, the one story that I, I've been telling since nearly the beginning is uh, Peterson in Popu, and uh, we met, um, um, Trevor and I and another friend of ours, Dale, where Dale had been the past president of the Theological College of Zimbabwe. He had brought Trevor and I there into this community and we were meeting with local pastors and they took us to a village and we met uh, Peterson's mom the day before she passed away and uh, leaving Peterson and his uh, younger sister Prudence uh, alone when she passed away because they had already lost their dad. And uh, at the time when, when Forgotten Voices um, became connected to Peterson and the Mpopu family, uh, you know, the oldest living person in that area was 18 and he was eight. Uh, and, and so just to see now, uh, he's 24 now and um, he's had a really hard life and, um, and his road has not been easy. And there's many things that make it not like a romantic, perfect story for donor engagement. But uh, the local church came alongside this family when he was rejected by his community, rejected by his extended relatives who were fearing that he was cursed by ancestors. But the church advocated for him and loved him and supported him. And now he's 24 and helping provide for his grandparents. And, you know, there's a lot of things that have been hard, but he's alive and he is clinging to the gospel. He's clinging to the profession of faith in Jesus and really loving his community well. And a community that's rejected him, he's still providing for it. Um, it is just a wonderful um, testimony to the faithfulness of the church and a faithfulness to the mission of Forgotten Voices. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And like the point where I connected was mm -hmm. with 
his sister. Mm -hmm. So uh, to paint the picture is we're showing up to a small little homestead um, and the grandparents are under a tree with the mom on a mat outside on a, I mean, she passed away the next day. Um, and I was sitting a little further away with Prudence. And she, was, she was four. Yeah. Playing with bottle caps, hitting me with a stick, mm -hmm. mostly because I think Dale was antagonizing her. Uh, he has, a way, he, does. He has <laughs> a way of antagonizing <laughs> In a delightful way. Very delightful way. But, like, the thing that hooked me at that point in time is you can talk about all the economic fast factors and like I'm a data guy but like that moment where you saw she was so emotionally disconnected yeah. the, at the family structure level the grandparents are contemplating the process of burying their daughter mm -hmm. which is gut-wrenching of itself you had her daughter their grandkid mm -hmm. off alone not feeling the love and support not being able to be held by the, her mom anymore. Yeah. Uh, the grandparents not knowing quite how to react. No one really knows how to react in, in these situations. Mm -hmm. That was just a, a point that just, it just killed your heart. Yeah. Um, that's, that's when you, you saw like everything that the church was doing. That was the point where love was being inserted into that family. Mm -hmm. that even if you did not have the capacity yourself yeah. to demonstrate love, someone was showing up and being Jesus in that situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the point that sealed it for me, of like, we got to do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was a lot of prayer. Now, I think the reality, the reality of, um, of doing this this ministry is that you have those days of life you celebrate the transformation that you see but then there are those moments too that it is hard in a way you don't see that change or that desired outcome mm -hmm. or things don't go as what we hope that's the reality of where we are mm -hmm. working in. and also just yeah. work because we're individuals even some of our yeah. church partners we have had challenges in this work that actually helps us even to be even more more aware of the need and even more aware of how do we even respond even in an effective way mm. moving forward so mm. so that's good thanks for sharing that because i mean it's not it's not a walk in the park <laughs> it is not a walk in the park even for our partners and yeah. uh, particularly as they are living and responding you know, in a in a hard context that they have so many factors that are changing that they have to adapt to every time. And sometimes from from this side we don't fully get some of those factors, but the reality is difficult for pastors who have to walk and leaders who have to walk and stay in their communities, yet there's so much brokenness around them. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and so what continues to inspire you to stay connected? In this ministry so for those who are you know who are wanting to get involved um, you know what kind of encouragement would you would you have to give someone who's wanting to get involved in this work get started just get started mm -hmm. uh, contact the staff figure out a way to plug in uh, it doesn't need to be grand uh, like I said thank you notes I mean my wife ran the year in statements out of our basement I mean, he was the first bookkeeper. I mean, there's skills that can be brought to bear in almost any situation. Yeah. Um, I, I, several of the saints in our in our group just prayed for us constantly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't yeah, go anywhere in the world. We knew they were praying. It, yeah, like, we're, we're sitting by that disabled car. I know Eileen Jeffries was praying for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so don't underestimate those small getting started points mm -hmm. and let God shape your heart in those small moments and lead you from there. Don't wait for the big plan to be unveiled. Mm -hmm. that, that would be my encouragement. Because what I'm seeing and what was so encouraging um, during the celebration dinner was to see mm -hmm. how God is moving hearts around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. All, I mean, I did not recognize half the faces mm. 
in that room, nor on the screen. Mm -hmm. And that is just a huge blessing that God is moving hearts and people in a phenomenal way. And it's, it's something that, you know, it's a privilege to join. So start small. That's what I would say. Yeah, I, I agree. Starting small. And I would also say, do something, you know, and start small, but do something. And I think that there's a lot of challenges in this world that have no earthly solution, but the orphan care crisis shouldn't be one of them. Like God so clearly mm -hmm. articulates what we should do. Like true and false religion is this colon. Now I'm going to tell you. Um, sometimes Jesus was rather obtuse and confusing in his, in his riddles and his parables. And, and, but you know, James, like <laughs> true and faultless religion is this to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself pure and holy before the Lord, like, or undefiled before God, like just do something because I think that we all are going to stand before the Lord yeah. and we shouldn't do it just to avoid, um, uh, not giving, you know, to avoid consequences for not giving God his due. But I think Trevor and I and everyone from the founding board and, and those who are core volunteers at the beginning join us in being in awe of what God has done by us doing the simple things that we know and doing something. Because God calls us to do this and sitting on the sidelines not only leaves kids and churches and families vulnerable, um, but it doesn't give God his due. So thank you uh, for being obedient uh, to what God called you to a few years ago. And uh, we are here celebrating what the Lord has done to build and to continue to equip the local church. And we are praying and uh, you know, trusting God for many more years. And uh, as we continue to really build on this mission and vision uh, to respond to his kingdom. So cheers to another 15 years and more <laughs> as God wills. But thank you so yeah. much for your, yeah, for your part in, uh, in that story. It is great to hear um, how it, it all began and to hear the perspective of our founding leaders. Now we want to hear from uh, the voices that we serve in Zambia, Zimbabwe and Malawi. And then after that, we'll hear uh, from Dr. Beverly Nyberg, who's our board chair, and she's going to share with us the future, the way we are going as an organization uh, moving forward. Let's take a look. First, we're traveling to Andola, Zambia, to meet a young teenage girl, Nitsa. When she was just two years old, she lost her father, leaving only her mom to care for her and the four other children. Her mom struggled to make ends meet. They were evicted from their home, went nights without dinner, and more. But God had a plan. A church partner of ours noticed the family in need and stepped in to help. They paid for Nitsa's and her one sister's school fees, discipled them at their church, and empowered her mom by investing in her market stand business. And today, Nitsa and her family are doing better. Her mom's business is growing, and the girls are doing well in school so that they can have a good future. Let's hear Nitsa's story in her own words. A lot has changed so far so good. A long time ago, we used to struggle to find food for the family, most especially my mom. She used to cry day and night, and that affect me in my siblings. I used to also cry because I was, I, I, I used to feel bad when I see my mom crying day and night, but since uh, after I passed my grade seven, my mom didn't have the money to take me to school. I stayed for one year without being in school. I used to admire my friend who used to go to school. They used to tell me a lot of things of, about what they learned. So I was so I was upset because I wasn't at school. My mom used to encourage me that one day God will provide for you. You also start going to school. She used to give me the courage and she was very kindly and supporting to me. Until the day my sister told me that we are expecting some visitors and the church came in and they offered to support us. They bought, they bought us books and paid for school fees, also uniform. Mm, to the girls out there who are struggling, they don't have money to pay for their school. There is always hope knocking at the front door. Open, to, open the door for hope to come in. Always have hope and faith in God. Put God first and then God will provide. 
Next, we're headed to rural Malawi to meet a woman, Lackness, who's a chairperson for a Savings and Credit Association, or commonly known as an SCA, that Forgotten Voices and its church partner oversee. And through this savings association, Lackness and her fellow caregivers have been able to save money safely, invest in their community, and most importantly, meet their children's needs. And life in rural Malawi is extremely difficult for families. Jobs are scarce, droughts are frequent, and children are often orphaned or struggle to develop well because of the extreme poverty. But we praise God for how he's provided for caregivers like Lackness. Let's hear her story in her own words. All of these stories have happened because of local churches in Southern Africa. We believe that these dedicated men and women are the best equipped to solve the orphan crisis. Through all of our work, we want to listen to and celebrate their voices. So with that in mind, here are some past, present, and future church partners sharing their hearts for this work. My name is Pastor Benjamin Mashonga. I am the pastor of Mushiri Evangelical Church. In our years of ministry, who knew that there will ever be other Christians from far places who would come to work together with us, especially in meeting our orphans and widows' needs? Imagine a situation where you are lifting a heavy load and someone comes along and offers to lift one side as you lift the other side. We are very grateful to God because this is all God's plan. And we can see that his people at Forgotten Voices have come to partner with us and walk along with us as we meet these people's needs. Orphans were lonely. Orphans needed um, someone who would stand with them. Orphans needed someone who would stand, walk by their side and be a friend to them. Some of them had dropped out of school. They didn't have fees. Most of them didn't even have food and other things for cleaning at home. So it was our prayer that God will, will help us but our, our church has been helping orphans for many years, since its inception, 1984. But it came a time when we could not afford anymore. We could only help a few, but um, our heart then, we were yearning to say, God, open a door, and this was the door that was opened. Forgotten Voices wants the church to be in front of the activity as they always share that the church is the plan A of God and so they want the church to be in front other than them being in front. We feel that promotes the kingdom mentality and it promotes Christ himself as the owner of all things. The, the Forgotten Voices organization comes and asks you to come up with your own plans, how you would want things to be done on the ground. So, how does this all work together? God is doing something special through the church. And despite huge challenges, the local church in Southern Africa is growing. The church is seen as trustworthy, reliable, and a light in a dark place. 
and the church is a reliable support system for many in communities across Africa. And led by passionate local leaders, these churches are critical to solving the orphan crisis. So that is why Forgotten Voices partners with these local churches. We work together to create safe, loving, and sustainable homes for children through carefully selected programs that empower families and help children thrive. And these services meet the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of orphaned and vulnerable children and their caregivers. The way we work can be broken down into three ways. First, we partner with local churches to identify those in need, host training on orphan care best practices, and more. And so our aim here is to listen to those local voices and ensure the work is sustainable and culturally relevant. We call this church-based care. Second, we want to ensure parents or caregivers of children have the right skills and resources to best care for their kids. So we provide caregivers or parents with economic empowerment opportunities like skills training, business investments, livestock, anything like that. We also provide parenting support and trauma-informed care. We call this family-focused care. And third, we want to ensure that every child's needs are met so that they can have successful futures. So that means we provide education support, trauma-informed care, and discipleship. We call this child-driven care. Through this approach, children can have successful futures and identity in Christ and heal from trauma. And their parents or caregivers can gain independence, be self-sustainable by earning income on their own, and most importantly, raise their children well. So, what can you do? James 1.27 tells us that pure religion is looking after the orphaned and the widow in their distress and suffering. So God is calling us to care for the least of these. And so now we ask you to prayerfully consider how God can use you. So, will you give to support this mission? Will you get creative and fundraise to support this mission? Will you pray for provision and wisdom for this mission? And so whatever you choose to do, God is working through you so that one day all kids will experience the love of God and the security of a family, church, and community. And so whoever you are, wherever you're at, God can use you to advance his kingdom and to care for the orphan and vulnerable. So we invite you to join this mission by visiting www.forgottenvoices.org. Hello. I'm Dr. Beverly Nybert and the chair of the Forgotten Voices International Board. And I'm pleased to be a part of this program. I hope that you have been inspired by how God has worked through the church and his people during these past 15 years. I hope you've also enjoyed and been encouraged by the stories we've just heard about what Forgotten Voices is doing right now in the present and have learned a little bit more about the model that Forgotten Voices uses in reaching out and supporting the churches, which in turn support the families. And now I've been asked to talk about the future. And as you know, that can be a hard thing to do. But there are several things that we do know about the future. First, we know that we have a clear mandate to care for the orphaned and the vulnerable children. This is made clear to us throughout scripture. And even though the number of AIDS orphans, children affected by and orphaned by the HIV AIDS virus has decreased, there still is a great number in need. As of 2020, the World Bank estimates still hundreds of thousands of kids in the countries we serve are orphaned due to HIV AIDS. But in the last few months, we have been challenged with a new source of orphanhood, COVID. Many of the elderly who were the ones who had taken over for the parents that had passed on, their grandparents are now dying from COVID. And we can see just in the last few months that the number of COVID orphaned children are increasing. But we know we also have a sustainable model based on Christ's indestructible church. 
Christ said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And that is why we are committed to empowering churches who then empower families and caregivers in their communities to care for the orphaned and the vulnerable children. We know that this is an expression of God's heart. We also know that we have a faithful guide, Christ our shepherd. And we know that he will continue to guide us as we lean on him and are remaining Christ-centered as an organization. And that is our first value, our, our first aspect of our character as an organization is that we want to remain Christ-centered. And in doing so, we know that he will guide us according to his plan and will for us. So knowing that we have a clear mandate and a sustainable model led by a faithful guide, Christ our shepherd, we move forward with our three goals for the coming years. First is to support a growing number of churches through a five-year cycle of capacity building. Each year, the church will then be able to reach out to more and more families and orphaned and vulnerable children in their community as they build their skills as a church. Secondly, we want to create a network of graduated churches for increased long-term sustainability. After the five years, we don't want to just leave them, the churches, but we want them to be a source of encouragement and knowledge for other churches in their areas and help them with mutual learning as they continue to reach out to their communities and to encourage one another, both past graduates and new churches. And thirdly, we really believe in this model. And so we want to share this model of church-based, family-empowered care of orphaned and vulnerable children widely. So how much does it cost to do this kind of ministry? Well, it's really quite effective. For a church, we spend approximately $6,000 a year, or boil it down per month, that's $500 a month, which is something I think most churches could take on to sponsor a church at $500 a month. Each church reaches approximately 60 families a year, which means it costs about $100 per family per year, which is less than $10 a month to reach a family of five with these skill building services and support that they need. Or you can help individuals. The average number of individuals that are served are 300 individuals per year which costs about $20 per year. Now to tell us a little bit more about how we can achieve these goals and what impact we've had thus far, I'll turn it over to our CEO, Shelton Taguma. We are thankful for so many of you who have been uh, part of our journey thus far. As we look forward, uh, we, we have a uh, hope to serve more often and vulnerable children uh, in, in Southern Africa. Our goal uh, for 2022 is to reach 1,500 more often and vulnerable children. As we have heard about the need that is consistently growing due to COVID and also due to poverty and HIV AIDS, we want to support local churches in doing that. So we want to invite you uh, to join us uh, in this journey and uh, there is opportunity for you to give 
uh, towards uh, this goal that we have. And uh, you can uh, go on our website to learn more or to give at uh, www.forgottenvoices.org. Uh, and every gift that is given uh, from now until the end of the year will be matched uh, up to 35,000. Uh, this is a matching grant that uh, our board of uh, uh, directors has uh, set just to encourage uh, us in this ministry. Uh, so we are grateful for, for, for that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and as we end our time together, I want to just uh, end with a celebration song from a savings and credit association group that I met in Chikwawa, Malawi on my recent trip. And uh, let's enjoy as they uh, sing songs of joy and uh, praise of what God has been doing in their lives as they've been part of this group, but also uh, just uh, praising God for his goodness uh, in this. So this is fitting for us to end with. So I hope you enjoy the song. Thank you again for joining us and uh, for taking time to celebrate 15 years of ministry uh, together.